Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, for the time being, I'm gonna close on this series. It may be titled different messages in series next year. Uh, you know, we as a church, we are, we're gonna teach the Bible at Calvary, and we believe in a biblical worldview on every issue. Um, so if I were to keep the title of this series to the day Jesus comes back, it could be, you know, hundreds of messages. So we'll change the titles and the themes to help address different things. So for now, I'm just going to put a little close on it as we celebrate Christmas for the rest of the, of the uh, season. And in 2023, just know that we're always teaching biblical truth. All right. And we're going to continue to do that. Amen. And we will be addressing things that, that people have not addressed in churches, and we're going to be preaching the truth in love. And so just want to keep that in mind. Today, I want to just share with you how we hold on, because I know we've talked a lot about holding on to truth, and I want to share with you how, how we hold on. What does that look like? And Ryan, how have you held on to the truth? You know, I turned 39 on Friday. Can you believe it? My goodness. Wow, that's crazy. How have I held on all these years? Why am I going to continue to hold on to God's word? I want to be practical like that and share with you. And if you would, open your Bibles to Philippians 2. We're going to look at 12 through 16. Verse 16 was, a, uh, it was an anchor text that I used the first message and, and the first uh, couple messages of this series. And I wanted to go back to it because it was a reference, but it wasn't something we looked at deeper. And so we're going we're gonna to address how we hold on to truth. And in Philippians, this is Paul talking to the church of Philippi, and he gives actually quite a few things in these four verses or five verses, some powerful truths, powerful things to help us hold on to truth. And this is what he says, and the title for my Bible says, Shine Brightly for Christ. What a great time to talk about that. Dear friends, you, all, you always followed my instructions when I was with you, and now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you. Now, this is, this is one of my all-time favorite verses. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So he says, you know, work hard to show yourself, you know, to show your salvation by obeying and respecting God. And it says that God helps you do that. How awesome is that? Do everything without complaining and arguing. My least favorite verse in the Bible. <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> do every, why does Paul put that there? My goodness, we're going to get into that. So that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God. Shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. And then he says this. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, that's the second coming, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. My work was not useless. Amen. Paul encourages the Philippian church in this letter to not be an idle believer, but to be actively growing and maturing in their new life from salvation. And out of respect and reverence for God's grace, Paul says, obey him. Work hard to show the result of your salvation Obey God. Now, you don't work for your salvation. You do not earn your salvation. You believed in Christ and received salvation. Okay, we didn't do any of that. But because of salvation, show that by working hard to obey everything he's commanded us. That's what Paul is saying, the essence there. We're not alone in this. There is a relationship and cooperation. God enables us. He enables us to do what pleases him through his Holy Spirit. So our responsibility is to follow his spirit at work in us versus following the flesh that we still 
and the, the human nature, the sinful nature that we still wrestle with, he says, choose to follow Christ in many other places in Scripture as well. This is more important to our subject of holding on to truth than we might think right away, and here's why. Idle believers who are not actively growing in following Christ are more likely to get pulled into the current of this world's culture. Work hard to show your salvation, to obey. Don't just chill. Don't just sit back, I'm good. God has saved me. It's in the idle life that we begin to get caught up in the culture of this world. If you're running the race, if you're following Jesus, you won't have time to get caught up in the currents of this world. Jesus went against the culture. Jesus went against the tide. If we follow Jesus, we'll go against, not in a, like, necessarily, you're always against everyone, okay? We're against sin, right? We're against lies, so we follow Jesus, but we love people on the way, and we're going to go against the culture, against the world's lies and sin. We're going to go against that, that current and follow Jesus, amen? Now, here's the thing. If we're not actively doing that, we're more likely to get swept into the tide, the current that's going the wrong way. Verse 14 and 15, Paul is urging the church to be blameless in little and big things. He says, don't complain. You know, what does he say in there? He's actually talking about like grumbling and complaining. And he might have in mind, scholars say, the idea of the Israelites always grumbling to Moses in the desert. Why did we come out here? There's no food, you know, that kind of grumbling and complaining. It also can be the strife within the church where we're grumbling and complaining about things with each other. We're fighting, there's infighting within the church body and it was hindering their light to the unbelieving world. You know, it's hard to shine for God in a dark world when we're being dark with one another in the church. When we're not getting over the small things and we're carrying these small things and complaining and grumbling with each other and irritated by one another, that, that darkness doesn't help us shine Christ in our community, does it? Paul urges the church to put an end to these differences so they will be innocent, clean children of God. This would keep the unbelieving community from having excuses or accusing the church of being no different than them. So he's saying live pure, innocent lives. Shine like stars. Shine brightly like stars in a dark world, in a perverse world. You know, light shines brightly in a dark and perverse world drawing men and women's eyes to the source of that light, which we know is Jesus Christ. I know I've said this many times, and you'll, you'll hear it again. <clears throat> and every, every, every Christmas Eve, I think about it. When we hold that candle up in that dark room, your eyes go right to that light. It's the same thing in this world. When someone walks around with the light of Christ, people are drawn to that. And Paul's saying, let's not let the grumbling and complaining within the church, let's not let strife, let's not let the little things or the big sins keep our light from shining in this dark world. Be different. Don't be perverse. Don't be dark in your life. Be like Christ. Shine Jesus in this community. What does that have to do with holding on to truth? We'll get into that as I apply it to our lives. Verse 16. Under what condition... Would the church be ready for Christ's return? And Paul's ministry would not be in vain or useless if the church continued to hold firmly to the word of life. That's what Paul is saying. Do these things, hold firmly to the word of God so that my ministry would not be in vain. It would not have been useless. Instead, when Christ comes back, you're ready. And not only that, your light shine for other people to come to heaven too. That's what he's saying, hold firmly. That is the condition. That is the condition of how the church is ready for Christ's return and ready, and the people in our community come to know Christ and they're ready, is that we hold firmly to the word of God because it's under assault today, isn't it? It's under attack all the time and it continues to be true and stand strong and we must hold firmly onto the word of God. Now, I love, I love what 
Paul says to his young pastor. I use this as well already. 2 Timothy 1, 13 through 14. He talks to Timothy in his letter and he says, hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching you learn from me. A pattern shaped by the faith and love that you have in Christ Jesus. Through the power, how? Not on your own power. Not on your own power, Timothy. Not on your own power, my friends. Not on your own power, Ryan. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. Carefully guard. Now, here's the thing. You can't change the truth, my friends. Neither can I. All we can do is guard it and keep it what it is by how we hold on to it, how we talk about it, how we teach what the truth is. You can never change the truth. You and I can't do that. That's what the world wants to do. They want to change what the word of God says so that their lives can fit into the will of God still. But we can't do that. It is what it is. The only thing we can do is we can guard it and teach it. And we guard it by holding on to it and living. Well, let me get into that. How do we hold on to truth? How do we hold on to truth? Number one, this might seem really simple, but it's, it's actually pivotal. Uh, number one, continue to believe the word of God. Ryan, what have you done to hold on to truth? Well, I continue to believe it's true. I continue to believe it's true. I mean, this is what Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.14 but as for you, he's talking to Timothy, the young pastor, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. He learned it from his family. He learned it from Paul. Continue to believe in what you have learned. This is simple but very important. 2 Timothy 3.13 says, evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So there's going to be deception that the word of God isn't true. Well, guess what, Paul, or guess what, Timothy, guess what, church, all of us firmly hold on to what you believed is true because evil spirits and evil powers are trying to get you to doubt the truth of God's word. Simple as that. The world and evil spiritual powers are constantly bombarding us with twisting scripture and casting doubt on its validity. And guess what? We have not had any evidence that would hurt the validity of scripture, we've only received evidence that solidifies the word of God as truth. We haven't received any new evidence that says it's all a lie, none of it's true, I have not found that at all. Every time people keep investigating scripture, it only solidifies that it's true. Over 16,000 archeological digs proving scripture, once again, in locations that they have found things, it's unbelievable. We cannot deny it. And some people will say, well, it doesn't necessarily prove it, but it does corroborate evidence. Yes, it does. You're right. It at least corroborates what we see in Scripture. It says, wow, that's where David lived. That's where his, his place of worship, there's Hezekiah's tunnel there. Oh, there you go. There's another altar with an inscribed name of God on it. Yes, because God is true. And still, no evidence has come forth to disprove that. So when the intellectuals come trying to deceive you and say it's not true, or some guy gets on YouTube and makes a channel and says all these things that are ridiculously lies and false, you can go, well, that's, that's not true. I still believe in the word of God. Amen. I still believe. So we have to be discerning, church. We have to have discernment and filter every new teaching with the word of God that has not changed. This helps us continue to believe and trust the word. By the way, my faith will always be in a holy God that does not change. In the word of God that does not change. Not in man and his knowledge. Our knowledge all combined is still foolishness to God's knowledge. I will always firmly believe in God and his wisdom and knowledge more than anyone else. And I believe, amen, and I believe this is his knowledge and wisdom. So you may be thinking, that's where I'm at, Ryan, I believe. But I tell you, as a pastor, I've seen people start to struggle with it, even in older ages. And you have to begin to ask why. Well, let's get into more of that. Number two, I think this affects it a lot. 
Why would we start to doubt? Two and three and four. But number two, keep the word in your heart. Store thy word in your heart. Store his word in your heart. I love Psalm 119. It's always been a life verse. How can a young person stay pure? How can anyone stay pure? By obeying your word. I have tried hard to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I hide God's word in my heart. I store it in my heart. I deposit God's word in my heart. And how often do I do it? As often as I can. Daily, sometimes more than, more than once a day, reading the word. Another great way of storing scripture is scripture memory is memorizing scripture, uh, having scripture on three by five cards and putting it on your dashboard. Obviously, you know, when you're not driving, um, <laughs> just have, I mean, pull it out if you're at, you know, you're in your parking lot at work and you're taking a lunch break, or whatever, just review, put it, put it in your Bible, put it somewhere, you know, anywhere you can get it to handy, bring it to work. I know we have apps for that now. I get that. But studies say if you write things down, it helps you remember as well. My, my son hates that, that statistic. <laughs> write things down, it helps you remember. I've been teaching him how to study, and, and uh, he doesn't like that, but it's true. My daughter definitely doesn't like it, but she got, she's, starting to, she's starting to like it because it works for her scripture memory. Psalm 119, 104, your commandments give me understanding. Hmm. No wonder I hate every false way of life. No wonder, no wonder I, I can see the false way because I have the word of God in my mind to help me to stay on the right path. By the way, Psalm 119 is a powerful psalm on the word of God. If you get a chance, digest it today. Storing the word in your heart, and really what that means is also in your mind, serves as a constant reminder. It serves as a filter. It serves as a nudge to choose rightly every day. Uh, I, I think about when I was teaching my kids how to ride their bikes and they would kind of start going to the right or to the left. You know, the word of God says, don't swerve to the right or to the left. You know, stay straight, stay on the straight and narrow. And I would kind of have to walk by my daughter and go, boop. Get back on the sidewalk. Stay away from the road. Boop. And just same thing. It's the same thing with, with the word of God. Every day it renews and nudges you to choose rightly. And when you store it in your heart, you can remember it as well. When you store it here, it can rem- you can remember it as well. Uh, the word pattern is used a lot in the Bible. Even 2 Timothy 1.13, Paul says, follow the pattern of the wholesome teaching that you heard from me and that you heard from your family, your mother and your grandmother. That's what he tells Timothy. Hold to the pattern, a pattern of wholesome, truthful teaching. Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Well, here's, that, here's another, here's another um, point that Paul tried to make in Philippians, that you give your life to serving God, to work your salvation out with fear and trembling, with reverence and respect for God. That You live the life. You don't just take salvation. Now you live it. Paul says it again in Romans 12. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, because of his grace, offer your bodies, your whole life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. How do we not conform to the pattern of this world? By being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Storing the word of God in your heart and mind keeps you in the right pattern rather than the pattern of the world. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You can't know God's will for your life if you don't know the word of God. And again, storing the word of God in your heart and in your mind helps you stay on the pattern, a little nudge in the pattern of Christ, not the pattern of this world where we sway to the right or to the left over every new wind of teaching. Oh, that's, that, sounds, that sounds appealing. I guess I can kind of still live that life then, I guess, and be a Christian if I do that. 
Eh. What's the Bible say first? Nudge back on. I'm telling you, this is how I've done it. Okay, this is how you look out. This is how, as a shepherd, I protect our church. You also have to protect your home. You have to protect your marriage. You have to protect your light, your example. You are also responsible of shepherding and guarding your light so when Christ returns, you are ready. So are your friends. So are your family. Know the word of God. Story in your heart. There must be a story in your heart and mind for a right living to become a pattern. How many times have you walked that path and you start to see the worn path? We have a path around uh, a pond in our neighborhood. They have a retention pond. And I can see that people have walked that path and I can tell they have dogs too. <laughs> and must not have doggy bags. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. We all sometimes forget to go back and get it. <laughs> There's a pattern because they constantly walk around that pond. There's a pattern when you rightly live the right life. You begin to walk the pattern. What's the pattern? Who is the pattern? It's Jesus. I follow Jesus more than anyone else. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. I love how he makes sure he, he puts Christ as the, the proper one that we're, f we're truly following. As you live, as you store the word of God in your heart, then you can live the pattern you're supposed to live. And we need to do it on a regular basis, store his word, so we can keep being nudged on the pattern. And then what happens when we get off, we can see the pattern that we were on and get back on it. Because the word of God reminds us to. Simple stuff, isn't it? But it's so true, isn't it? A pattern serves as a default response. A constant reminder that the way of Christ is the right way. You've done it before, and you choose his way again. No matter how many new enticing ways there are or will be, the straight and narrow pattern is the right one. That's what keeps me holding on to truth. And thirdly, live the truth. We have to live the truth. John 8, 31 through 32, Jesus said this to his people and to those his disciples were there, and to everyone listening, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen. True disciples, true followers of Christ, remain faithful to love and obey the word of God. The plus side is the word of God leads us to freedom. Instead of being slaves to sin, Shame, lies, and despair, we experience forgiveness, peace, and joy. That's what the Word of God does. It sets us free from all the other things and brings us into a life of love, forgiveness, joy, peace, comfort, every fruit of the Spirit. We are in Christ. He sets us free. He wants us to live that kind of life. But the condition is we must follow and obey His teachings. It doesn't just happen by accident. It doesn't just happen by storing in our minds. Now we have to operate in what we've stored in our minds. We plug in the program, and then we need to live the program. Amen? Get a little computer terms, I guess. Download that in your heart and then live it out. Living the truth validates truth. This is more important, too, that I think we kind of miss. Living the truth validates truth because we learned in this series that wickedness suppresses truth. So that means righteous living doesn't suppress the truth. It glorifies it and keeps the truth alive, keeps the truth shining. How do you hold on to truth, Ryan? I live it because when I live it, it works. It works. And when I see it works, it validates the truth. It confirms, oh, well, that did work. Oh, I mean, we do that all the time in life, don't we? If you drink eight glasses of water a day, you'll feel better, you'll feel healthier. You do it, yeah, wow, well, it actually worked. You sleep eight hours a day. Some of you are like, yeah, I wish. <laughs> it works, you wake up rested. What do you know? You, you, we, we learn these things by doing them. If we exercise, we feel better about ourselves. Uh, chemicals are released in our body all these different uh, serotonin, oxytocin, all these things work to help us feel better. When we do it, it works. 
My friends, it's the same thing with the Bible. When we live the word of God, it works. When we work the word, the word works. I've said that before. And it, it's, it solidifies that the truth is real. But it goes further than that. Because living the truth, what Paul's saying in Philippians 2 is that living the truth helps us shine like shine the truth like stars in a dark world. So God wants truth to be known and experienced. He wants us to be faithful to live the truth, to show the world the way, the truth, and the life, which is Jesus Christ. So for me personally, I can't help but think missionally every time I, I look at this scripture. Because Paul's thinking missionally, evangelistically. God is too. He wants you to experience truth. Like we heard Stephanie's testimony up here. How powerful was that? The reason why you were impacted by her story and other testimonies is because it's truth validated. It's truth lived out. And Paul said, I want my testimony. Here I was the worst of sinners, but now by my testimony, everyone can see that anyone can come to God and have eternal life. That's why we live truth. We must obey the word of God and let it come out of our lives. Living truth also served as an example for the next generation. Paul said, follow the pattern of the wholesome teaching you saw. And he was referring to his grandmother, his mother, and himself. Uh, I, can't, I can't say this enough, and I, there's no other way of saying it, but your life is an example for everyone watching of what truth is. And I want to say thank you. Because even, uh, you know, I, I know I'm the leader of the church. I know I'm a, I'm a shepherd. I'm a pastor. But your example encourages me to live the truth. Your courage, your strength, your obedience just in, in, continues to help me live the truth. We are here for each other. Amen? And then our kids, our next generation need to see what truth looks like. They need, it to, see, they need to see it lived out. And lastly, number four. You just have to sometimes just be faithful under pressure to hold on to truth. We just got to be faithful under pressure. We got to, you know what I'm going to say? I'm going to put it this way. We need to hold the line. The word of God, the truth, does not change. I'm going to say it again. The word of God, the truth, does not change. We just got to hold that line. In love. Be faithful under all the pressure of this world right now. I'm telling you, man, I just saw it this week. Your character will be attacked because you don't agree with people. This church is being attacked because we, what we've already started talking about. There's going to be pressure. There's going to be smearing of your church. There's going to be smearing and shame uh, being put on you for believing in God's word for holding the line. Church, be faithful under that pressure. Be faithful under that pressure. The opposition will be louder. It's always louder. But our praise and our faithfulness to God doesn't need a bunch of noise. When Jesus suffered on that cross, it says he spoke no words to defend himself before he went up. He could have he easily done what he needed to do. Peter talks about it in uh, 1 Peter or 2 Peter 2 or 3 where Jesus suffered but he was silent in the sense that he did not, he chose not to defend himself. I'm telling you, the opposition will be loud. They will say a bunch of lies about your pastor, about you, about this church, the pressure because your character is under attack, the pressure because they're smearing your reputation. All those things are going to come. Just expect it. And it's a storm. How many times have people been canceled and then you forget about it? How many people have been canceled in the past 10 years by society, by Hollywood, by all these things, and now you don't even know, you, don't, you haven't heard anything about it. Everyone forgot. You know why? They moved on to the next person. Get used to it. Jesus was canceled and crucified. Be faithful under pressure. Do not move. 
one of the most loving things you can do for this world is not move. So that there will be a constant anchor, a constant for them to run back to when the world fails them. That's why I hold the truth. I hold the line. That's why I want to be faithful under pressure. Scripture says in Psalm 119, 89, your word, O Lord, is everlasting. It is firmly fixed in the heavens. I'm going to move fast, and then Dorothy's going to come out. Your word, O Lord, is everlasting. It is firmly fixed in the heavens. Psalm 119, 160, the entirety of your word is truth, and all your righteous judgments endure forever. Isaiah 48, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Because he loves us. And there is a way to heaven. And there's only one way to heaven. And it's not going to change. Because he loves us. Because there was only one person who could cover all our sins. So it's already been fixed. The way has already been fixed. Think about that. He does not need us to include sins as okay. Because they're not. He had someone cover and forgive us for all of our sins. It's even better. That, that's better. I know that's, that's a heavy thing to think about, but chew on that, reflect on that. That there is, there is uh, nothing that he would include as okay now that has always been sin. Because he dealt with it with Jesus. He paid for it with Jesus. So follow Christ instead of following that sin. That's what he's saying. That's, that's the essence of all the scriptures about repentance. Jody was spot on last week when he said, don't follow crowds that do not describe or uh, subscribe to God's truth. Don't follow crowds. Know your friends well because bad company corrupts good character. And if your friends aren't in the word of God, be real careful. Refuse to be led astray, he said. So true. Uh, the church in Revelation 3, 10 through 12 was uh, the, the Philadelphia church and an angel gave... Uh, revelations about all these different churches and this one's true for all of us he says in revelation 3 10 through 12 and this is future things um, that he's talking about here because you have obeyed my command to ber to persevere i will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world or who belong to god i am coming soon hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown all who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. Mm. And I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from the heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name, claimed by Christ, instead of being claimed by this world. Hold on in the face of pressure. I'm going to say something heavy. So next point, when, when rubber meets the road, are you ready to be loyal to God over everyone and everything else? And this is something I've said, and maybe people have said this before, I don't, I don't really care about coining it or not. Will you even serve king over kin? Will you be faithful to God even if it means that your family disowns you? I know a lot of Muslims right now who are converting to Christianity and their family is disowning them. And they count it a joy to be claimed by Christ, to be adopted into his family. Are you willing to disagree with your own kid? Are you willing to disagree with a spouse who's not living the right way? My wife and I have talked, and we, we don't see us going the wrong way here, but we agreed, if one of us was off, we would disagree. I know people say blood is thicker than water. Well, the blood of Christ is better. The blood of Christ is better. I want to serve Jesus because his blood bought my salvation. My, my wife, my kids, my family members, they didn't buy my salvation. They didn't die for my salvation. Jesus did. And I will serve Jesus over everyone else, no matter who they are. I don't care if the whole world is against me. If God is for me, who can be against me? Amen. Now, the world is going to see that and go, man, you hate people. 
No, I don't. I love God. Don't let, it, don't, don't let them twist it. You really hate people for that. No, I love God. And I love him enough to hold on to what is true so that you know the way, the truth, and the life. That's why I hold on to truth. Amen. What I have discovered is when I let the word of God get a hold of me, I haven't wanted to let it go. As we hold on, hold on to God's word, God's word holds on to us. Mm. That's what I found. How about you? God's word holds our lives together. You're not falling apart. You got God's word. You got God's promises. You got Christ. You're not falling apart. Things feel like they're falling apart. A lot of things feel like they're going wrong, but you're not falling apart in God's hands. He's going to take care of you. I know it's been hard. It's been a hard three years, hasn't it? But you're still here. God is still faithful. His word is still true. Amen. Amen. Church, we'll be talking more about different things and different series on holding on to God's truth. Just like I said, in different uh, themes and messages, we're going to preach the word of God. And uh, I just want to encourage you through this message. Don't be swayed. There is nothing, there, it, it is the right thing to do to hold on to God's word. It's the right way. Um, I, and you know what? A lot of you have been doing it and have been a great example for me. And I want to say thank you. I appreciate it. This church has been amazing. And we're going to continue to do it. We're going to continue to hold on to God and his word. Let's pray. And Dorothy, come up and share some good things. And, and uh, we're going to pray for our offering and everything else. And appreciate everything you guys have been doing for our church, getting ready for this Christmas season. Big, big season. Man, over 1,600 meals. I know I was gone on Thanksgiving service to celebrate that. Over 1,600 meals on Thanksgiving Day. That's a record. That's amazing. Praise God. So, man. Lord, we thank you, God, that you don't change. Your word doesn't change. And, God, we hold on to your truth. We continue to believe the truth no matter how many people attack it. We continue to store your word in our hearts. God, we continue to live the truth. And we continue to be faithful under pressure. God, your word holds on to us as we hold on to you. You hold our lives together. We're so grateful for all that. Thank you, God, that we have seen your word work in our lives. And God, today we decide that no matter what pressure comes, we will hold on. And we are in good company, a cloud of witnesses that have done it before and will continue to do it again. Help this church, strengthen us, Lord God, to do it to stay faithful to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.